Our second passage this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Listen for how the Spirit is speaking to the church today. The Passover was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And so making a whip out of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house shall consume me. Then the Jewish leader said to him, what sign can you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they said to him, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the body of his temp the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Patrina, if you want, I think that Miss Siobhan is here. Can you imagine this? Jesus' first really public act of ministry, and he cleanses the temple in Jerusalem. Now, in the other Gospels, this account appears part of Jesus' last week of life, during what we call Holy Week. And we can reconcile its position there, I think, by saying to ourselves, well, he knew the end was near, and so he took a big risk. He had nothing to lose. Maybe. For John's gospel, though, Jesus is going to lay it all on the line right out of the gate. There is no mistaking who he is or what he's about. Why are you selling sheep and goats and cattle? Why are you making this a marketplace? Turning the table over. Thank you. How can you even think of profiting on the backs of your Religious siblings. Whose interests do you have in mind? God's or your own? Clearly, Jesus did not get the note in seminary that you are not supposed to make any changes in your first year of ministry in a new place. The exception, of course, being if there's a global pandemic in which you are forced to make changes, which you may or may not want, but I digress. As we discussed in Press Pause this week, in our midweek Bible study, neither did we get the memo about angry Jesus. We have, it turns out, been to churches that have glossed over this part. Likely, we decided, for fear that it would inspire our own self-righteous anger in unhelpful ways. However, it is a very human emotion, supremely relatable to most of us. So let's look at what angry Jesus has to offer us. First note, 
that he does not go to the temple armed. That means he's not anticipating that this is going to be any kind of challenging situation. It's not a preconceived idea. When he gets there, though, he's clearly frustrated. And so he makes a whip out of cords, and he drives people out. Now, the gospel does not say that he whips anybody, though Jesus himself will be whipped before he hangs on the cross. Neither does Jesus degrade the merchants personally. Now, this is the second place where John's account differs considerably from the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, but you are making it a den of robbers. But instead, here in John, he says, Stop making my father's house a marketplace. I want to pause here on what might look like a technicality because that was also one of the things we noticed immediately in press pause. There is no language here like, you brood of vipers, which we were sort of surprised about. Researcher Brene Brown has done significant work around shame, and she reminds her readers that the di there's a difference between shame and guilt which we sometimes mix up because those feelings stem from realizing that we've made a mistake. We feel guilt when we have done something bad. We feel shame when we are told we are bad. It's why parenting books warn not to say bad boy or bad girl to a child and instead say, I don't like what you did. Perhaps then there is a significant difference between telling people they are robbers and saying they're making the temple a marketplace. So I want to suggest there are maybe three takeaways from angry Jesus this morning. It's not premeditated. He does not physically injure people. He does not personally degrade people or say that their mere existence is bad. Most of the time when we get angry, I think, we are reacting to something in the moment. That's not so different to what Jesus is doing. But sometimes, sometimes, we have a long list of things that we've been keeping handy just waiting for an excuse to let loose our ire. We may not be plotting or scheming exactly on how to do that, but if we're keeping a list in our heads or in our hearts, we are fueling our own wrath, right? Because when we start to burn, it's not going to just be a little spark something sparked by our emotion in that moment. It's going to also be this thing you did a while ago and this other thing that you did, and then there was this. And pretty soon we have a bonfire. And that's what leads to war. And that's the kind of thing that provokes a person to find an AR-15 and shoot up whoever is in their way. And that's not the example that Jesus sets. And it is not a healthy way to live. If you have a list, I want to suggest you need to start addressing those items one by one. Jesus doesn't seem to have a long list that he's been keeping for just the right moment, though certainly we can say he would be justified if he did. He does not expect to go to the temple and unleash his anger. 
He does not physically or emotionally injure people. One hopes that the merchants and bankers feel remorse for what they have done and change their ways. The way Jesus has been angry with them, prophetic anger, we might say, sets them up to turn from their habits and choose a new path. And I think that's why this is here, so early in the Gospel of John. John's Gospel will illustrate a number of signs that show that he is the Messiah. But make no mistake, in John, Jesus, as a prophetic presence is incredibly important, not only right alongside with his teaching and healing and preaching. As Johannine scholar and homiletician Caroline Lewis points out, this placement in John's gospel means that John has to have another reason for why Jesus is arrested and crucified by the authorities. This isn't going to be the reason, like it is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And for John, that reason, that's the resurrection of Lazarus. To bring someone back from the dead, Caroline Lewis says, will elicit the desire to kill Jesus. Life begets death, which ironically underscores the truth of the incarnation. You see, friends, in the temple, Jesus is disrupting the systems that have been in place for so long, the way the temple has always done it. He starts there. But the system that he's really trying to disrupt is our lives. Our notion of what does make life and what is death and what resurrection for each of us can look like. Jesus is not quibbling about maleficence or mismanagement, Dr. Lewis writes, but calls for a complete dismantling of the entire system. Underneath this critique also lies the intimation that the temple itself is not necessary. At the center of such theological statements, she goes on to say, is the fundamental question of God's location, which we be confirmed in the dialogue between Jesus and the authorities. Where one looks for God, expects to find God, imagines God to be, those are all at stake in the Gospel of John. And in Jesus, God is right here, right now, in the flesh. Not located in one specific place. That Jesus is the revelation of God, Lewis writes, the one and only God. All pointing back to this essential truth that God is with us. So as the conflict... Yeah. Um, So as the conflict begins to resolve, the point of this really, right, is that God isn't in the stuff. God isn't in the specific liturgical practice. God is not even in the evenly placed tablecloth. God's maybe not in the money. But God is in the baptism. In the beauty in the world. In 
the light of the world. John writes in 150 to maybe 200 AD, after the temple has been destroyed, It's important that we understand that context and our own, that story of hope. As Caroline Lewis writes, as soon as we are comfortable or complacent with God moving into the neighborhood, we ignore the radical, unbelievable claim of the word made flesh. We should be uncomfortable with Jesus' presence. Just enough to pick a better way. Just enough to know that we really are truly and beloved children of God. Just enough to know that we bear Christ's light to the world. So beloved, this week, In what way will you embody the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people around you? In what way will your posture, your presence, your words, the things you say or don't, the way you care or don't, in what ways will you bring just a smidge of Jesus' light to those around you? Let's make that this practice this week. I think that's what angry Jesus is really after. Let's pray. Holy God, in so many ways you disrupt our lives. You want us to be more faithful. less enamored of the systems of the world around us and more enamored of the system of love that you are continually trying to weave. So forgive us, we pray, when we fall short of that and make us a better part of that web, a better part of that weaving this week. Help us. Thank you. Amen.